Hi, everybody, and welcome to Friday Night Flock Talk. I'm Robin Saw Leather Ells, and I am here with Jack Pine from High Redbird. Hey, Jack, how's it going? Hey, Robin. I am really excited for tonight's session because I think this is a great topic, uh, and I think a lot of people are going to really benefit from this. So. I, I think, you know, it's it's something that we've kind of hit on before, but I know that before we get into things, do we have any notifications or reminders? We always have notifications and reminders. Um, so yes, before we get into our very fun topic tonight of turning tricks into husbandry behaviors, um, we did want to, I know, right? That's not clickbait at all. Um, we did want to let people know a few things. <laughs> First of all, don't forget that we do these Friday Night Flock Talks every single Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you want to make sure that you like the Leather Elves page on Facebook because if you do that, we can participate directly in the conversation about any of these that we have. You'll get notifications uh, covering what topics are covering coming up. You'll get notifications when we start the live stream. So if you tend to forget things, um, as long as you have your notification settings up to date and ready to go, you will get a notification whenever the live streams start, so you're less likely to miss out. Though, of course, we do know that sometimes life happens. Sometimes you do need to do other things. Um, we will miss you at those times. But you can always go back and watch these sessions on the High Redbird YouTube channel. Uh, they are all put together as part of a playlist. We are now at over 40 hours of content on that playlist. So, uh, you know, you definitely want to make sure that you go over there, subscribe to the High Redbird YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of the fun things that we're doing. Uh, Robin and I both also have Instagram accounts. So you can follow us on Instagram uh, at either the Leather Elves or High Redbird. Um, we'll obviously give you information about the sessions that are upcoming on there. But there's a lot of different interests, toy ideas, birds interacting with toys. Um, I usually post a lot of, of baby. And, um, so clearly mine is better. Um, <laughs> I know. But hey, I got to go with what I've got. I've got baby animals, so I've got to use them. Um, and then we did want to remind you um, that a very, very fun event is coming up. Seattle Parrot Expo is going to be starting uh, September 26th and 27th. Uh, so if you'd like to see more information on that, you can visit their website. It's going to be www.theflightclubfoundation.org. Um, it is an absolutely wonderful venue. Um, Robin and I have both spoken in the past. Uh, and, you know, for me, it's really exciting because it's one of those venues that has educational information for parrots and parrot owners, but also for kids. Um, it's one of the events they do a really great job about showcasing bird behaviors and avian intelligence and getting kids interested in interacting with that. Um, so yes, that's going to be uh, Flight Club Foundation. That is based out of Seattle, Washington, um, but they do have uh, virtual options available as well to watch virtually. So even if you're not local, um, if you don't feel like traveling to Washington, you can, of course, watch online, participate online. Um, so again, you can see all of that information for that on your screen right now. Um, and we did also want to let you guys know that you have a one. Um, Rob and I are both on the National Food and Preservation Foundation. Uh, that is a mouthful. That will always be a mouthful. The NPRPF, Board of Directors. Um, NPRPF has currently organized a quilt raffle scholarship. Um, so you can purchase raffle tickets uh, that will be for the quilt that you guys see on your screen right there. On September. September 3rd, so you've got a little over a week left. Apple's going to happen. Uh, we are going to be all of the funds for Quilt Raffle, the Georgia Fletcher Memorial Scholarship Fund through the Quaker Parakeet Society. Uh, that scholarship fund benefits 
veterinary students focusing on avian medicine. Um, so it is a great way to support the future of aviculture. Uh, and of course, you have the potential to get a really nice quilt as well. Um, so I think that is all of the reminders that we have for this week. Unless, I don't know, Robin, did I forget something? No, I think that's it. Um, there is a lot going on. And the fall always brings a lot of exciting events. So we'll see as they come up, you know, what's going to happen. Oh, and Halloween's coming up. So we've got some some Halloween toys at the Leather Elves if you're interested in, in getting spooky. Uh, so we've got some of those. And tonight's topic, um, you know, when you get that bird and you want to show your friends and you want to um, show your friends how cool they are. And we all want everybody to feel the same way about birds that we do. So we get into the, you know, trick training or um, show behaviors, depending on um, what, you, you know, you want to call it. And those trick, we, we looked at some of those trick training items and we thought about how you could make them work for you for providing husbandry. Um, so, Jack, have you ever had to kind of morph a, a trick into a husbandry behavior? Um, yes, and vice versa. Um, I think the really important thing to remember is training is all going to be the same. Uh, when you're wanting to train a behavior, when you're wanting to work on things, the approach that you're going to use to get there is going to be the same regardless of whatever the behavior is. So whether or not to teach a parrot to say hello, if I want to teach it to wave, to pick up things, if I want to teach paint, uh, if I want to teach it to participate in a beat trim or a nail trim or a voluntary blood draw, all of those, while vastly different behaviors individually, the process of getting them, of building them, is going to be the same. It, it definitely is. And I think, you know, your training is always fluid, but the terms and the language remains the same, regardless of what you're trying to train. So I think it's important that we do a little bit of a refresher on some of those training terms. So can you get your smart glasses out, Jack? So All right, we need our smart glasses. Give your smart, we need our smart glasses. Of course, now I can't read, but oh, look at that. We look brilliant. You guys should listen to us. <laughs> All right, so quick refresher, a behavior. A behavior is simply the way an animal acts in response to a stimulus. So that's pretty basic. Um, so that's, that's just, you know, when we talk about a behavior, whether it's a trick behavior or a husbandry behavior, that's what we're talking about. All right, Jack, you want to do Q? Q is a signal to the animal that reinforcement is likely to be available if in response to a certain requested So I think the key there is requested. We get stuck in that sometimes and it's not, not, we get a bunch of behaviors and a lot of times that's a cool way to capture a behavior. But if you don't ask for something, then you haven't cued it. And then reinforcing that behavior doesn't make a lot of sense. So that's what a cue is. Okay. So a bridge. Right. And I think, go ahead. On, on cue, I think it's important to remember uh, requested is that important part as well. When you think about a lot of times our birds will start offering up behaviors. Um, how, how many people have encountered the bird that says, hi, 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 hi. If you did not request that behavior, you are not obligated to provide that reinforcement in that situation because you didn't cue it. Um, so just a really little thing that people uh, get into a little bit of trouble. Uh-huh. And I, you know, I think too, request. 
because you're requesting a behavior and you're not commanding or demanding a behavior. That's, you know, people say, well, the step up command or the, you know, the wave command and, you know, okay, yes, it's semantics, but to think of it that way, it's easier for me to think about it as a request. So, okay. So after the cue and the behavior, you've got the bridge. We're not talking covered bridge, even though I'm here in New Hampshire, we're talking about the signal to an animal that reinforcement is coming. It marks the behavior that the animal is doing for reinforcement. So timing is critical with a with a bridge. When the you when you do your give your do your bridge, um, it's that moment that says this is what I'm looking for. Okay, all right. What else have we got, Jack? Well, with the bridge is really important because a lot of people want to that automatic reinforcement. Oh no, the animal did what I was asking for. I need to, let me reach in and get a treat for it right away. In the time that it takes you to change from what that animal was doing to you getting that treat and everything else, the animal may be doing something completely different. So you may not have the opportunity to indicate to the animal this is what you're being reinforced for. Instead, if the animal did a really cool behavior, you reach for those treats. And uh, in the time of you reaching for those treats, the bird has started, you know, picking at the tiny little feathers under one of its wings. You just reinforce for picking at those tiny little feathers under its wings. So a bridge is really, really important. <laughs> um, Linda just said, is that calling it a marker? And that's absolutely what it is, Linda. It's the bridge. It's either the bridge that takes you from the cue, you know, to the, from the, from the behavior to the reinforcer, or it's a marker. It's the same thing. Yep. Yeah. So the next obvious term to discuss would be what is a reinforcer? Um, a reinforcer is uh, a consequence of a behavior that increases the likelihood that that behavior will occur again. Um, and I think it's really important that you think of the, that term this way, because a lot of people have difficulty with the idea of consequence, because consequence can sometimes have a negative connotation. In animal, a consequence is simply the result of what happens. So a consequence can be a reinforcer. A food reward, something your animal is excited about, that will increase the likelihood that they'll want to do it again. All right. And there are two kinds of reinforcers. Um, there's a primary reinforcer that is biologically important. So, food, water, air, sex, um, those are all primary reinforcers. And then, secondary reinforcers are significant, but not essential. So that's just the, it doesn't, you know, need to know that there are two different kinds. And the secondary is generally paired with a primary to start with to become a reinforcer. You got the next one, Jack? Yes, yeah, so approximations. Um, this is, Rob, for Robin and I, these, this is one of our favorite terms. Um, approximations are the small parts of a behavior that come together to result in a behavior. I think it's really important for people to recognize that any behavior, no matter how complex it is, can be broken into approximations. Uh, if your animal is physically capable of doing a behavior, you can break it into approximations to make it manageable in terms of training. And I think approximations can vary from, and you know, the same behavior may be, you know, one animal needs five approximations to get from beginning to end of a behavior or to put the completed behavior together. And then another animal may only need two. So you've got to be willing to be flexible with those. And then, the last term we want to go over is shaping. So shaping is the reinforcement of successive approximations of a desired behavior 
building a complete behavior. Um, so it's taking all those approximations, stringing them together and shaping that behavior. So it's, it's really the finished product. Okay, so are we done being smart? Never. Hey, we're back. Did you miss us? <laughs> Those were our smart cousins. <laughs> um, so all of those terms play into how we do training. And, you know, trick training, husband do training, they're the same behaviors, in my opinion, but with a different goal. I mean, what do you think, Jack? Yeah, I think what your goal is is going to be important. Um, trick training is typically going to be those things that are fun, that are exciting, behaviors that you like to show your friends, uh, behaviors that you use to showcase how amazing parrots are. Um, behavior training is more youthful, but not necessarily as, short as interesting behaviors. Um, if your animal has great recall, if it is well scale trained, if it is well crate trained, those are going to be exact examples of you know great husbandry behaviors. Your friends to say, "Look how amazing my birds!" Yeah, and. Jack, you know, we might I want to try Wi-Fi. It's it's really kind of spotty trying to hear what you're saying there. If you want to try switching your other internet provider? Okay, so I can fill while we're doing this. And Eva, shaping is definitely the challenge of training. It's putting all those pieces together. You might be able to get the approximations and you move on, you know, based on when you finish one approximation, you move to the next one. But at the same time, you've got to have that, that end complete behavior in mind. So you take those little pieces, those little parts, and you put them all together to form um, the larger behavior or the desired behavior that you're looking for. So you're back. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> so, so Melissa said that Zorro has great husbandry and how is recall husbandry? So any care that you're providing, anything that provides better welfare, Melissa, can be considered husbandry. And the recall, it, you know, to, to have a good recall, to have, uh, you know, whether it be from across the room or it's um, from far away, it's really important to have. And so I think that recall plays into further building on husbandry behaviors. What do you think, Jack? So... Understanding the, the entire premise of this presentation, us discussing moving from tricks to husbandry and vice versa, um, is basically just an idea of what goals you're going to have in mind. Because as we're going to demonstrate through this presentation, there are several tricks that actually have the potential to be great husbandry. Um, with something like a recall, one if you can get your bird to come closer to you, you could obviously use that as a means of assessing their overall physical condition. When your bird comes up close to you, you can check their feather condition. You can check their body condition. Um, for a bird like Zorro that I know is recall trained to fly to you, you can assess how are they flying? How are they moving? Um, because especially for a bird, um, you know, if you have a bird that's starting to get a little older, if you have a species that has a tendency towards, uh, you know, getting a little chunky, um, I don't really want to call any birds out, but I'm looking at you, Amazons. Um, if you have that ability to see how they are moving, um, you can use that to assess their overall well-being. Uh, if you have a bird that is recall trained for flight, you can then shape that to be part of their exercise routine. If they're flying to you, if they're flying to a perch, um, if they're flying from one person to another, if you have two trainers in your house, um, that is a behavior known as A's to B's. It basically you fly from point A to point B. It is a great way of getting your bird to exercise. Um, 
So just basic recall training. I mean, there was what four different ways that that could be used in terms of husbandry. So just think about any behavior you're training, any behavior you're seeing, what can you get out of it? Because I can almost guarantee there is always something that it can be used for other than just the basics of look how cool my bird is. Well, and, and I think the that's least, the whole. Yeah. I was going to say at the yeah. very least, Birds are cool too, so they're, they're, that is always a part. Jane, Jane has owned up to the fact that galahs get chunky too. It's true, but you know we just like to pick on the Amazons, Jane, because it's more fun that way. Um, but we we have our we know our Amazon owners out there, and and we know that that makes the hair on the back of their neck stand up. So we do that on purpose. Um, but you know, I think going from any behavior, any, you know, you can work it into husbandry. If you look at, so husbandry, uh, did you want to define that, Jack? What? Yes. Okay, go right ahead. Um, so um, husbandry, uh, I'm going to put on the smart glasses. I needed the moment to put on the smart glasses because I'm having to compile. You need to listen with my head. Okay. There we go. Um, the, re the really fun part, Robin, so with my smart glasses, um, I don't get the reflection from my lights in my glasses because there's no actual glass in my glasses. Uh, um, husbandry is simply the policies and protocols that go into how you are taking care of your animal. So if you look at things like training, diet, Basically, any aspect of your care, the way that you take care of your animal, that is its husbandry. So I, you know, anything. So it's a fancy term that I think people like to use, you know, when they're making lists of things. Well, I've got to put this on my husbandry list and it's a husbandry topic. It's really about that care and welfare. So just about any behavior you can morph it into a husbandry behavior. There aren't a lot of things that we're going to train our animals to do that can't in some way be applied if you're creative enough. And I think, you know, a lot of times we'll say, people will say, well, okay, my bird does this, this, and this, but I can't get him to, you know, show me his feet so that I can check his feet. So if you're a little bit creative, you just don't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, and, and I think we people get stuck on, well, this is for, oh, Diane Hyde. Um, Nick, don't you even dare put up that comment from Diane. Diane says, riding a bike. All right, Diane, I need you to answer this question for, for extra points. Um, what husbandry behavior could you get from, from riding a bike? Oh, she's so <laughs> cute. You know, uh Anyway, you you can um, oh there it is. I Look love at the you, beautiful <laughs> Wow. Well because we, that's a naturalistic anyone, behavior. What? For anyone who is just tuning in who hasn't witnessed this very entertaining debate between Robin and I, um, Robin does not like little birdie bicycles. Um, if you get her on the right day, you can see this vein right here threatening to like <laughs> pop into a full aneurysm because she'll just, where are they getting these tiny little bicycles in the wild? And who's teaching them how to ride their bikes in the wild? And wait, where are they riding these bikes in the wild? Because there's nowhere safe for them to ride them in the wild. If you go down to the ground, that's where the jaguar eats you. And you ride the bike in the tree on the branch, you bike, and if you if you happen to tip over, you're on you fall down. And clearly you haven't learned to fly because you're not a normal bird. So you can't but, save yourself. Um, so as far as I am concerned, yeah, riding a bicycle is not what I would call a natural behavior for a bird. But training the bird to come up to a bicycle, training it how to use the pedals. For me, 
begins with desensitizing the bird to new and potentially aversive stimuli. So you get the benefit of that. Um, you get the benefit of socialization. Uh, it is another way that you can train. You can build that reinforcement history with your animal. So I don't necessarily mind if you train your bird to ride a bicycle um, as long as, you know, you are doing so safely. You're not, you know, leaving the bird unattended because it's not safe to leave the bird unattended if he doesn't have his little birdie helmet. Um, and I don't, I haven't seen appropriately sized, like, little birdie knee pads and stuff. Like, what if he falls down and skins his knees? It's true. It's true. And, you know, <laughs> the, the monkeys teach them, you know. All right, but just because we met at AFA, I, I don't know if you're allowed to be that funny on the live stream. You know, the, the funny is usually left up to Jack, but um, we'll, we'll go with it. So, so, and Melissa's not going to tell me she's getting one for Zorro. Well, you know, when he falls off his bike and, and I don't want to hear about it, Melissa. I, I don't want to hear that Zorro is broken because he fell off his bike. I'm just saying. All right. So well, yeah, and, we have gone off the bike path. You're right, Lori McFarlane. Well, one sec. Okay. Because we do need to jump back into the presentation. But I do, after Diane's last comment, I do need to ask. She mentioned helmets, knee pads, gloves. Birds use their feet the way that we use our hands. So does a parrot wear its gloves on its wingtips or its feet? Um, I really would like to know what people think. So if you want to chime in in the comment section, I, where does a parrot wear gloves? Okay, so we had somebody in the beginning of the live stream that um, was watching from a veterinarian hospital. Um, honestly, we're not always this bad. And we promise we'll get back into we'll get back into the topic. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We've got behaviors that definitely can morph from tricks to uh, to husbandry. So the first one we want to talk about is wings up. Um, we've got there you go. There's wings up. Look at that. And a lot of our macaws will do the full extension of the wings out. So that's a pretty cool behavior, right? That's something that you could, you know, get your bird to do and definitely, um, you know, impress your friends. But Jack, what else could we use wings up for? Yeah. So um, depending on what you are getting out of your wings up, um, there's a there's a couple of different things you could ask for. So this bird right here, this is Max. He is a 35 year old. Timne African Gray. He he does it from a stretch standpoint. So that is about as high up as those wings go. He doesn't fully open them out. He doesn't flap them. Um, but even with this behavior right here, when those wings go up, you can get a really good look under those wings. You can check the feather condition under those wings, which is normally somewhere that's a little bit hidden. Birds keep their wings closed when they're not flying. Um, it's a lot harder for a bird to hide its body condition if its wings are up in that position because you don't have the wings hiding anything. You don't have, you know, as those wings go up, it's pulling everything so that you can see, you know, do you have that chunky monkey bird um, or do you have a bird that's in good body condition? So there's a couple of ways that you can use that. Um, if you have something like a macaw or a bird that's been trained to do not just, a, you know, that light partial wings up, but like a full open, you can fully check down the wings to make sure that the wings are in good health. Um, if they do that flap, you can see how the wings are moving. And, you know, I think too, a lot of times when birds start, you know, they may start over preening or plucking. Um, that's a place where it happens quite frequently is, you know, under the wings. And so if you can get them to do that, Oh, there you go. Um, Adrian just said the exact same thing. If you can get them to do that full, um, that full wings up, then that's, it, you can sometimes nip that in the bud before it becomes a really, a much worse problem. Um, so, so from a simple wings up, which looks super cool. And I noticed Terry called it Eagle wings. Um, Ooh. that, you know, that we, we, I used to cue that I'd say, you know, can you be an Eagle and, and give a, a hand gesture hand cue and the bird, you know, full up and people just go, oh, you know, it's, it's a very cool behavior to get a bird to do. 
And at the same time, you're accomplishing some husbandry tech, some husbandry stuff. So, well, all right. And Eva pointed out something really, really cool um, that uh, she said that she is currently working on this with a green wing um, to try to make it not scary for people. And I think that's really important just by changing, um, changing the cue that you use for a behavior or putting a behavior on a cue so that you can use it to make the animal fun or impressive um, is sometimes all the work that it takes. Um, to give you guys a great example of that, Gunner, my dog, who is currently, um, we're, we're going to say he is supervising production of the live stream. Um, he, he's sitting over there taking a nap right now. Um, he does a behavior that started off as up. So I would cue up and he would come up on me and do his little, little paws up on me. It was a very useful behavior, but in terms of presentation, not as exciting or dynamic. So then the cue for that behavior was changed to give me hugs he does the exact same behavior, but now little kids see it and they think, oh my God, he's amazing. He gives hugs. So mm -hmm. um, I think that is a great usage, Eva, um, you know, of adding behaviors, um, you know, think about what your cues are, how are people going to be receiving them and those behaviors. And I think too, it's, you know, it's a matter of Eva knows to read that body language and she knows, you know, is that what the, the green wing is doing? Is the green wing using that as a scare tactic? Or if she, you know, reinforces that behavior, suddenly the green wing's like, um, okay, I can do this on cue when she asks for it and I get reinforced for it. So, you know, it's it's turning that behavior around and making it not um not something that's that's intimidating. So um all right, what about step up? So I know we've got um We've got step up on cue for so many people. And what are some of the, I mean, some of the things you could use that for, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that step up can be used for, you know, it's, it's, um, it now, can be. Now, great behavior to start off when it comes to training your bird is going to be teaching them to step up. It does give you the opportunity to easily move your bird around. Uh, and for most birds, it's going to be a pretty simple process. Uh, it just goes with the cue. Come here, step up. And you can see it goes pretty easily. Uh, now, one thing you do want to keep in mind when you teach a bird to step up, you are also going to want to teach them to step down. Good bird. Making sure that your bird knows how to get up and down from your hand is going to be important. Now, depending on what bird you're training, some of them are going to be more comfortable. Uh, instead of having the hand presented from in front, they may want the hand presented from behind. Grayson here likes to go in front. Um, and they may also want to step forward or step back to get off of your hand. So it's important that you teach step down because you don't want to have to walk around with a bird on your <laughs> arm for the rest of your life. Um, although I have had those birds that you go, okay, step down. And they look at you like, no, I'm really good right here. Not going anywhere. Um, but so as you noticed, so when Grayson stepped up for Jack, he was closer and, and he was closer and he was, it wasn't a struggle. It wasn't, you know, I've got to get you on this certain spot. It was, Hey, now you're closer. I can do a little bit closer visual exam. Um, and then easy transition to scale training, right, Jack? Yeah. When you can easily pick up, you can move your bird. Um, honestly, you have so many options that open up because I would say that that can be an easy transition to something like, Station training, just training your bird to go to a particular spot. Scale training is just station training, but on a scale. The scale is now your station for that. Um, they're thought of as different behaviors, but they're all the same thing. Uh, crate training is station training, but inside a crate. Um, all of those kind of involve your animal being able to get to its station or its scale or its crate. So if you have that step up, that step down, it just makes it a lot easier to train those behaviors. Absolutely. And so, so step up is kind of, step up is the step toward, it's an approximation towards a lot of other different behaviors. So what about um, turnaround? I think turnaround is a fun behavior. People think it's really impressive when you do it. And it's like, it's pretty simple to train. Um, 
but you can use it for other things. So what else do you think, Jack? Um, what could we use turnaround for? So turnaround for me, um, I like to use that to, you know, normally when I'm interacting with a bird, I get a bird. I like to have them up on my arm. I can see them. I can directly interact with them. I see the front of the bird really well. The back of the bird would be a little bit harder to get to. So if I can train it to do a turnaround, um, and I, I love how I'm just like, okay, here, let me, I'm going to show you guys. Here's how I'm going to, to train that behavior. Um, and usually, yeah, if you have a target um, or if you have something else under it, you can just from doing this, if the bird's like, what, what is that? What's going on? You can capture a turnaround real well. You can see the back of the bird, which can sometimes be hard to do. You can see how they are using their feet. Are they able to use both feet to move around? You can see, um, especially if you do a turnaround on you, but even if you do it on another perch or anything like that, um, you can see how are their nails hitting at that perch? Um, are the nails at a point that, you know, you maybe need to think about a nail trim? Do you need to think about uh, changing the type of perching that is in your animal's enclosure? It, does it not have things that, are naturally wearing its nails down. Uh, like we said at the offset of this presentation, there are so many different things, different pieces of information, different decisions you can make, depending on how you're willing to think about them. You know, absolutely. And I think um, the, like Jack said, assessing the nails. So you can tell, you can also tell how their grip is. You know, I mean, if you've got a, a little bit older bird and you want to think you're thinking maybe this, you know, there might be some arthritis, there might be some issues with, um, you know, his ability to hold on to things. If you've got a bird on your arm and you're you do a turnaround or just a step up for that matter, you can assess what that grip is like. Um, you know, it's you can see if they don't. That's another great point, Lori. If they don't keep their head straight or they're not tracking, there could be something neurological going on. It's really about you know, all of these, when I think about it, have to do with observation. You know, we've talked about, you've got to observe what's going on. You've got to be aware. And it is a great wellness check, Terry. You know, just see what, what's happening. How are they doing? Are they able to do that turnaround? The other thing is, if you train these behaviors when you first, you know, when you, you initially get your bird, and these are the kind of things that you train, yes, they're impressive to your friends when they come over and meet your bird for the first time. But you can also gauge if there's any loss in that behavior. You know, if you're working with a bird on a regular basis, you're doing regular, consistent training, and then suddenly a behavior breaks down, okay, there might be a, a medical reason for that. You want to check and see. Yeah, and we're talking about birds tonight, but I feel like that's an important aspect of general animal care um, that a lot of people may recognize from different animals they have trained. Um, so the best example for that that comes to mind, rollover is a great behavior uh, that dogs are trained to do. And I have seen a lot of dogs that will learn the behavior, they do the behavior, and then they hit a point in their life where either, hey, we've reached the point where we're a little bit old, rollover is a little bit harder to do, um, maybe mm -hmm. I'm starting to have difficulty with arthritis. Um, so it can definitely help you assess and manage the progression of things like that. Um, but also, you know, if you're for some owners that love to shower their animals with treats, um, that, uh, you know, weight management can be a, a component of that as well. Um, if it gets to the point where your, your animal cannot roll over like it used to, because physically there's, more of it than there used to be that can help you manage that as well did i say that as nicely as possible that was really diplomatic i was very impressed um and melissa makes a good point birds can learn to roll over as well um it's particularly um popular with kayak owners i've seen that you know so many times so and it's really it's a good way to kind of just keep your eye on things and see what's going on um, so another behavior that a lot of people will train is the wave. Um, and there you go. There's a way that's a great, that's a wave with attitude. I like that. 
Um, so Jack, what kind of things are you checking with a wave besides it being ridiculously cute? So uh, again, you can get a really good look at those nails. Um, but for me, a wave is one of the best times to check for pododyne. Bleh. That really is a really difficult term. It just fell out. So Let's try again. Podo Pododermatitis is the word you're looking for. Pododermatitis. Yes. Um, it's also commonly known as bumblefoot. Um it's typically going to be caused by your bird not having an appropriate variety of perching sizes, textures. Um, basically, if you, you have your bird on one perch all the time, it's going to create pressure. It's going to create difficulty on the foot in particular spots. So when that bird does something like a wave, you can check those feet for pododermatitis, for that bumble foot. Um, looking for, you know, redness, swelling, sores uh, when it gets really advanced. Um, and then it can get even worse than that. Um, and, so, you know, I so think... those... Go ahead. The, those would be the main things. But also, again, if your bird picks up one foot, we can assess how... I, I'm doing a little cockatoo dance. Um, assess how your bird is moving. How is it shifting its weight? Um, if your bird doesn't want to wave on a particular side. Is there a reason why? Um, and to give you guys an example of how I use this, um, so I we showed you Grayson. Uh, I think we actually have a couple more videos and photos that we'll show you with him. Grayson waves with his left foot. Um, so every time I cue for him to wave, he picks up his left foot and says, I. I can also cue him to shake hands with his right foot. Um, it is always cued to a particular foot, so that way if I need to look at one foot or the other, by using the appropriate cue that goes for that foot, I can see both feet. Now it is possible to train your bird to wave and to get them to wave on either foot, um, to shake hands, to get them to shake hands on either foot, um, and the way that you're training that is completely up to you, your individual bird, um, what works for your situation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, as we look at all this, these different behaviors, you can put them in a series too. You know, I know with Charlie, our dog, we do, you know, he does a sit, stay, paw, other paw, you know, nose bump and down. And so Charlie's getting up there in age. So I can assess um, you know, how's he doing today? Is he, you know, is he got, is his back leg sore today? Um, and you, it's very obvious the way that reaction happens. Um, you, what are you doing, Jack? Are you trying to get Gunner to play? I No, I was going to get Gunner to do something. Cause so this entire session, we've talked about turning tricks into husbandry behaviors. Um, but I was just going to take, cause you're talking about a dog now. I got to, um, you are fully capable of turning husbandry behaviors into tricks as well. So, uh, hey, Mr. Gunners, do you want to come here? Do you, do you want to be the movie star? Yes. So you can, uh, one of my favorite things to train a dog, to train any animal is steady, basically to hold a behavior, hold a position. Um, so if a dog sits, you hold it steady so that you can move around it. Well, with Gunner, steady. Steady. I can train him to wear these smart glasses. All right, he's a good boy. Can I have kisses? <laughs> Thank you. All right, you can go back to your nap. And, well, and Diane brought up a good point back when we were talking about, um, you know, turnaround that, or I think it was turnaround or wave, that she has Cody um, do that while he's stationing to extend um, the duration of the of the station. Um, so if she's got him waving and doing other things, she's working on increasing that duration. So, I mean, that's a great way by putting them all together that you're seeing, um, you know, you're seeing that, that progression and the extension of a behavior that you've already got. So, and I think too, you know, with the wave, but Terry, that's exactly what I was going to say with the wave. It's, it can be that initial step to letting, you know, your bird allowing you to trim their nails, you know, and it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be the wave out on the perch. Like it doesn't have to be outside. You can get them to wave 
and then hold um, inside the cage bars. You can get them to wave and put their foot up on a, on a perch and go around a perch and then work on nail trim. Um, so there's so many different ways to extend these very basic behaviors to be more useful and more effective for you in your care of your, in, you know, the welfare of your bird. So, um, okay. Our favorite target. I, I, I would, you know, if you guys, if we had like a collection and we got five cents for every time we told you guys to train target, you would just, you know, we'd be wealthy. So what, what can you use target for Jack? So, um, you know, targeting one, just like with the step up, the step up gets your bird to go to a different place to do a different behavior, scale training, crate training. Um, if you have a bird that doesn't necessarily want to step up, and those birds do exist, every bird is completely individual. I have met birds that love interacting with people, love that degree of training and socialization, but they don't want to step up onto your hand you can use target training to still give that bird an idea of where you would like it to go. Um, if it's doing that, if you can get that bird to move to different places, you can then reinforce that. And that does a great uh, service to your bird for the care of your bird. Because, you know, if you have a bird that doesn't like to be, doesn't want to step up and you need to get it into its crate, um, if you have to go in and grab up that bird, for a bird that doesn't want to step up onto your hand, that grab up can be a little bit traumatic. Um, one of the things Robin and I like to point out, like to try to help you guys find ways to have a better relationship with your bird. And part of that, I feel, is giving your bird that sense of control in its environment, that sense of, um, you know, I'm going to do this at my level of comfort. And as you're working on that, with that targeting, you can get your bird to go so many places. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, and targeting works in a variety of different ways, basically, however you train it. Um, so I typically train a bird to do, um, th this is actually one of the first photos I got of Widget when we were starting training. Um, so I was basically happy with any targeting that he would do. So you'll see right there that his beak is lightly open around that bead at the end of that target stick. It's not a target pole because he is a tiny little bird. He is not a camel. Um, but typically what I like to do is then I like to train them to target with a closed beak. But you can train your bird to target or touch train. Um, you can train them to do it with their beak or their feet. So again, target training could be used for those nail trims. If you train that bird to target with its feet, uh, if you train that bird to target with its beak, uh, does your bird potentially need beak trims? Um, if you have a bird that you have to work with on that, that might be something you want to consider. Uh, you might want to prioritize training a trick like that because it has the potential to lead into that very real aspect of bettering your husbandry, bettering the overall care of that animal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, you know, so with Widget here, it's um, it's open mouth, which is another behavior that you can train as well. You know, and it was funny because I was watching you as you were talking about this, Jack, and you were doing this hand signal. I could see it You were because I know you've used that for open mouth with other animals before. Um, and it's funny because I kind of went, <laughs> and you did it. It's, but an open mouth touch um, allows you to look at the inside of the mouth. Um, you can, you know, a lot of you have the uh, the leather elves pens with the lights on the end of them. That's a great way to look inside your bird's mouth and make sure that everything's going on. I've had people say, oh, yeah, so there was like a lot of spit in my bird's mouth. Yeah, Bird, birds don't have spit in their mouth. That's not a good thing. So, you know, if you've got a bird that you can, that will on cue open their mouth, um, then that's a great way to look inside and make sure everything's going on well. Um, so Eva, your bird will do, will try anything. So that's, that's wonderful. I mean, if you start with that target training, you can take it, make it an approximation on the way 
to a bigger behavior. So you take those approximations, you take that target stick and you make it part of the approximations in a shaping plan. So, you know, you've got those, uh, the, you're reinforcing those successive approximations to get to a desired behavior, to build that complete behavior. So by using targeting, Eva, you are in essence, um, adding that target in and shaping a behavior. So, yeah, I think, you know, the target. And the other thing is it's nice to be able to get a look at your bird's beak without them, you know, without it coming at you in a, in a forceful way. Um, and if you, they'll target closed, closed beak, you can take a look at it. You can, you know, really inspect things. If you've got a bird that might be starting to have some problems or Jack, don't you have one of the birds at the farm? Is it Mika? Doesn't Mika need work on, on the beak? Yeah, Mika actually has a scissor beak, so his beak doesn't align properly. So, yes, we are checking his beak daily to make sure that it is not time for, um, you know, there's work that we can do with his beak, but there's also work that he needs to then have done by the veterinarian just because of how involved that scissor beak is. Um, so... Uh, earlier, Melissa was asking, how do we train that open beak, um, that open mouth? Um, there are a couple of different ways to train that. Um, and that, so that's one of the things that I actually wanted to talk about. So all of these behaviors, there's probably going to be a different way that you can shape those behaviors. There's different approximations that you can utilize. Um, if you reach out to someone like a behavior consultant or a training consultant um, to, to give you guys an example. If you were to reach out to me and Robin and ask us for a plan on teaching a behavior, um, both of us could give you a plan to teach a behavior, but it may not consist of the same steps. Um, right. So just be aware of that, that there are different ways to get to that. So with something like an open beak, um, one, birds yawn. Um, they will open up their beak, you can opportunistically catch that, um, especially if you know that it's happening. Because it typically happens in response to similar scenarios every time, uh, typically happens at similar parts of the day. So as long as you're ready to capture that, you can reinforce that behavior. Um, one of the ways that I have trained it with birds that I need to get it a little bit quicker, because um, the great thing about capturing a behavior is your bird's already doing something. You're able to reinforce it, um, but you're kind of stuck waiting for it to happen sometimes. And um, Sometimes I want to get things moving a little bit faster. Um, using something that is not a food item, is not something that your bird is, um, you know, trying to eat. It's not focused on that. Handing it something like that, you can use that to reinforce that. So uh, wooden beads... Um, as they come closer to your bird's beak, as you see that bird opening up its beak to, uh, you know, come come closer, to lean into that. You can then reinforce that there just at the point of, I leaned in and I opened my beak. Um, and the great thing with that is not only have you trained the beak open, like you would do when it's normally yawning, but that lean in that you're getting as well serves the benefit of getting the bird to lean into you. So if you're doing this to look inside that bird's beak, you're going to be in a better position to do that. So there's different ways that you can train all of these different things that we're talking about. Yeah, there definitely are. And it's about what works for your bird. You know, um, I know Lori just, uh, there was a comment there from Lori about different birds learn differently. And so, you know, Lori and I have discussed um, that she has a bird that is blind and you're going to teach something very differently to a bird who is visually impaired than one that is fully sighted. So you just have to create, when you're, you know, when you wanna shape a behavior, you need to make sure that those approximations that you're using are appropriate for that particular bird. And so, you know, I could give you, you know, Jack mentioned that two of us might have different ways to train the same behavior. I could write out a, a plan for how to do target training but it's not going to be the same for every bird. It's not going to work for every bird. And I'm gonna to need to tweak it a little bit. Is it the same basic premise? Yes, it is, but with different modifications and a little bit different changes um, based on what bird I'm working with or what animal I'm working with. 
Um, station we've kind of covered. And I think, you know, like Diane said, if you can increase the duration of a station behavior, that's wonderful. I also like station, you know, station is a great way to, again, have your bird stay there and be looking all handsome and pretty. Um, but if you've got an emergency, this is where that recall comes in as well. Um, you know, Melissa mentioned that, that Zorro will recall from anywhere in the house and he'll blind recall. So if, you know, heaven forbid something happens to Zorro and Melissa needs to take a look at him pretty quickly, if she's got him stationed and recall trained, she can recall him to a station and then get a real quick visual on him without having to touch him at all. Um, so that's one of the things I like about station training. Jack, what else could we use station training for? Well, so like as you just saw in that video, uh, Grayson was trained to that small tabletop stand, um, which if you guys don't already have one, they are very easy to build. Um, and I do have a tutorial on how to build small stands like that over on the High Redbird YouTube channel. Um, so you could definitely check that out. It could be your fun weekend project this weekend. Um, but you can see that that stand, it's a small tabletop stand that I could use in a variety of places. That stand fits perfectly on the scale that you can see right next to it. So station training to that, uh, that stand moving the stand so that it's then on the scale. Um, if you have multiple birds, uh, you guys can see on that PVC tabletop stand, there is vet wrap across the top that gives the bird a great grip. If I have multiple birds that I'm training and I want to station them in particular spots, I'll change the color on each of their stands and then they get used to. So if it was uh, Grayson goes to the stand with blue, Mika goes to the stand with red. You can then use that to shape those behaviors when you need your birds to not just be somewhere, but in very specific spots. That's just one additional thing to think about. Um, and I think another thing that we pointed out through our actions, but we haven't actively said yet, which this is very late in the session for us. We always talk about this. Um, make sure that you are recording your training sessions so that you can see what is going on. Um, the really fun thing that Robin has already pointed out, so with me talking about all of these different behaviors, um, as you guys are watching me on screen, like you're seeing what my physical cues are for each of these different behaviors because they are just ingrained in how I do them. So I'm like, no, we get the bird to step up and we do a turn around, we do a target, and we open our beak, and we wave. Um, yep. Hands up. There. <laughs> So record those Wait. training sessions so you can see what's going on. And and it's, you know, the important thing about that is too, if you may be inadvertently giving a hand signal and not even know it, you know, I mean, and then you can say, oh, look at that. I can just use the hand signal instead, instead of that verbal cue, which I got to tell you for our friends who are not bird savvy, um, hand cues are mystical. They're, they're just like magic. If you can get a bird to do something with just a hand cue, people think it's magical. So when Jack was mentioning the stationing, I know um, Buddy Waski, who does a lot of free flying, I've been to Buddy's top secret location um, where he was flying his birds for a while. And Buddy would let them, you know, they would fly out and then they would, you know, do their thing and circle around. And Buddy had them all recall trained. He does free flight with them on a daily basis. And he had on his porch, he had duck, you know, um, vet wrap and they were different colors. And he was working on getting different birds to when they came in from their free flight to land on certain colors. So that again is something that's kind of cool. And if you've got a bird that maybe shouldn't be next to another bird for whatever reason, maybe they've got history or, you know, um, so you put them, you station them on different colors that are at opposite ends of um, where you're working if you've got them out at the same time. So station training is another one of those behaviors that has so many different applications and, you know, some are fun, some are very useful, but above all, I think it's a great behavior to train um, that, that you can use in a lot of different ways. And then I know we have one more behavior that we wanted to talk about. And um, I refer to it as the Boeing climb. 
And this is just a great way to do, to get your bird doing some exercise. And again, it looks so much fun. I mean, if you guys know Julie in the back, Julie Corwin, Julie's giggling back there. This is uh, Julie's bird, um, Doobie, and the and Melanie from um, Hari. And we've shown this before on one of our um, live streams. But getting the bird to, to do a little bit of exercise, keeping him cool while he's doing it. Doobie's clearly enjoying that, that misting. But then... She can also, at this point, she's got him. She's assessing, like, how's he handling this? Is he, he's willing to climb up. He's using um, his beak. He's using his feet. He's using his wings. And all of this is through a very simple behavior that wasn't even necessarily trained. This is more of capturing um, play behavior. So, Jack, have you ever done any kind of, you know, just the play, um, you know, capturing those play moments? in order to get a behavior. Yeah, and so for anyone who hasn't already seen this video clip, uh, we did use this video clip earlier. Uh, we did a session on uh, using play as a means of animal training. Um, so a couple of things that I wanna point out here. Um, one, we cut out the audio because, um, oh my God, they would not stop giggling. Um, we've got Jody, we've got <laughs> Melody, both are, probably more excited than the bird <laughs> yeah um that's enough nick that's fine that's the no no more no more <laughs> um loud chattering primates um with that bird like you can see the excitement that is present between the bird and the handlers the trainers um i think a really important aspect of training that a lot of people don't think about making it enjoyable for you making it a way that you can you know, you, you're not just building the relationship where the bird likes you. You should like the bird, too. So having these fun things that you can work on are a great way to build that relationship both ways. Um, and you can see this really showcases thinking about how to use things differently. Uh, most people get something like that boing perch, which is a, a spring basically covered in a soft rope. Um, they'll hang it on the cur on the cage, they'll hang it in the play stand, and they'll leave it alone. So Melanie is showing you here, this isn't hung up. She's using it to move the bird around, to get the bird climbing around that structure. Uh, maybe a little bit of bathing on that, which could be a great behavior as well, because um, all birds bathe differently. Um, and I'll tell you guys right now, I have some of my birds that when it rains, they are most of my birds, since I am on the Gulf Coast, they are lucky enough to have outdoor enclosures. When it rains, they will hang from the ceiling wire. Wings are flapping. They are losing their minds because rain is the best thing ever. Um, and then, of course, I do have a couple of birds that when it rains, they're in their night shelter area because they don't like when the water falls from the sky. It's supposed to only be in the water bowl. Um, but, I mean... I, I think we can all relate to, to our birds having particular opinions about things. Mm -hmm. But th this right here showcases changing how you think about using the tools at your disposal can have a difference in the opportunities you have available. Making sure that your training sessions are fun, engaging, enjoyable for you and the bird. Um, you know, we, we always talk about you don't want to push your bird to the point of boredom with its training sessions. You don't want to overwhelm it. You also don't want to do that with you. So if you can do something like this that both you and the bird are excited about, you're going to have a much better chance with that training. And I would argue any behavior that you can get that you are able to reinforce, that you're able to build a reinforcement history and a training relationship with that bird, no matter what that behavior is, if you are able to utilize your positive reinforcement that we were talking about to build that relationship, you are going to better every single potential training interaction you will have with that bird in the future. Absolutely. And, you know, building your relationship is, is so crucial to being successful in sharing your home with a bird. And I think, you know, taking all these very straightforward behaviors using them to provide better welfare, better care, 
I think that this is, you know, it's a win-win situation. So um, hopefully some of these ideas will help you guys with your improve your husbandry. I'm sure you're really working on that anyway, but these are just some, some easy ways to get, uh, you know, to get that extra eyes on, get that look at the bird um, so that it makes it just a little bit easier. I do, um, I do need to, before we do the trivia question, I need to shout out to our buddy, Frank from New York. Um, Frank messaged me before the session. Frank is still in Facebook jail, um, but we want to thank him for his support. Um, even from Facebook jail, he gets a limited amount of Facebook time and he's using it to listen to Friday night flock talk. So thank you very much, Frank. We, we really do appreciate that. We're looking everywhere for you and your wonderful comments. And I know you only have a few days left in Facebook jail. So, you know, hopefully you'll be back with us next week. Um, so our trivia question for tonight is what is the definition of shaping? This is, this is, we've talked about it several times tonight. Um, as always, the, uh, the answer is mentioned more than once um, in, our, in our live stream. So poor, poor Frank, I know Frank is always in Facebook jail, Lori, but we, we love him anyway, you know? Um, <laughs> there you go, Candy knows. Candy's a New Yorker too. Um, so yeah, we gotta send our love to Frank out there in Facebook jail. So you guys, so you're avoiding the question. What's the definition of shaping? A little bit. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the other thing um, I want to tell you guys is next week um, is a pretty important week. Okay, Julie's. I think. Let's see. Small approximations that string together for the results. What do you think, Jack? I like I think that. that sounds good. Okay. So we're going to go with Julie. Um, hers came in first. Uh, thank you, Julie. And we will, let's see. Um, if you want to message me, um, I think that's good for a toy from the leather elves. And which brings me to another point. Um, if you win the Friday night trivia, Jack and I, um, we might have the smart glasses, but we forget a lot of stuff. So if you win something and you don't, you know, hear from us, reach out to us because we, you know, we want to make sure you're getting what you're winning because that means you're paying attention and we love the paying attention. So, um, so if you've won something in the past, reach out to us and remind us and we'll make that happen. Um, but next week is a really important week and I'm not going to tell you why now I'm going to have you, um, watch us next week, tune in next week and find out why it's an important week. And, um, with the leather elves, I can tell you that there will be a special code that you will get next week, um, that might facilitate your shopping at the leather elves. So um, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of good reasons besides the fact that Jack and I are fabulous, um, you know, for you to tune in next Friday night. But um, next week, our topic is going to be how to introduce a new bird to the flock. Is the addition appropriate? We're going to review quarantine protocols and then the introduction phase. So, Jack, any final words on turning tricks into husbandry behaviors? I finally got you to do it. <laughs> um, I, I, I really do want to say, you know, thank you guys so much for participating in these sessions. Um, if you watch these videos afterward, um, but haven't yet signed on for the live streams, we encourage you guys sign on for the live streams because not only do Robin and I have, you know, a set outline of the topics and, terms that we're going to cover. Um, but we do like hearing from you guys as well about what, what would you like to have more information about? What would you like to, uh, assess, uh, examples that you guys have? Um, so hearing from you guys is always wonderful. So thank you guys so much for tuning in, being a part of the live stream. You really do make this, um, an incredible, enjoyable, um, 
absolutely wonderful uh, thing that, I mean, at this point, like, I don't know how long we've been doing this, but it really feels um, like it's been no time at all because y'all have made the time fly. Um, so thank you so much for being a part of these sessions. Um, and I hope that we see you guys again. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, Jack. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of weeks when Friday is the high point and not, and owning my own business, it doesn't necessarily mean I have the next couple of days off. It just means that Friday's the high point because we get to interact with you guys and it really is enjoyable and meeting so many of you at, uh, at AFA for the first time was, was really um, a lot of fun. So I want to say thank you and um, we will see you guys next week. Take care, be safe.